Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Williams. I uh, am the facilitator of the open data uh, specification for uh, trail system data called Open Trails. Um, open Trails came out of a fellowship project that we did last year where we worked with a group of parks uh, that um, are all adjacent, but they span different levels of government. Uh, there's a national park, the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, uh, state parks and, and local parks, and a trail system connected all of them. And together they hosted about 8 million annual visitors, but those visitors had to get information from three to seven different websites if they wanted to stitch together a complete picture of the Cuyahoga Valley region. So we realized that this national park in, a, in an urban area is, is not a, um, it's not the exception to the rule. In fact, uh, as the conservation movement sort of bloomed across the United States, there was a scramble to protect land any way you could, whether that was a land trust or a, a local government or a state government or the National Park Service or the U.S. Forest Service. And so all of our lands are sort of fractured across um, jurisdiction, but they're not, that's not the experience for visitors in the real world. And so we decided that um, uh, uh, we would take this to the broader conservation and geospatial community and see if there was interest, and sure enough, there was. And so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about what we did uh, before we get into the rest of the presentation, which is really a pretty technical, um, uh, technically oriented presentation. It's really about the data model. It's about how you can uh, use some of the existing tools in the ecosystem. And it's about how you can prepare to publish open trails uh, going forward. But just to preface that a little bit more, we did do a, um, we, we are proud of the governance process that we uh, undertook as part of the specif specification development. Uh, we had a formal request for comment period. We did a lot of outbound outreach uh, to folks uh, in the space. Um, advocates uh, like the Trust for Public Land and the National Recreation and Parks Association, who has uh, you know, thousands of members, that uh, hundreds of which are trail stewards, uh, and uh, for which the NRPA serves as a, as a, um, uh, a source of best practices. Uh, we have uh, consumer technology companies that have guided the development of the spec uh, to help us ensure that this government data can find its way into consumer apps uh, when it's ready. So Strava and All Trails uh, should be thanked for their participation. Um, uh, Trailhead Labs, uh, Jeremy and Ryan's company, is a Code for America accelerator company. They have emerged as a key provider of commercial services in the ecosystem, which has really enabled a lot of other developers, uh, as well as um, uh, Esri. Uh, Esri, uh, the R&D shop in Portland in particular, Jerry and Nate. Um, they uh, have done a really great job helping us build a web native standard that is for use by Esri shops. Almost 100% of park and public land agencies use Esri products. And that's their primary technology, that's their primary relationship to technology. So as a result, this specification sort of meets a lot of those different um, uh, communities' needs. It's uh, designed for uh, Esri shops, government shops, to publish open data for use by developers in consumer technology in a way that meets the best practices established by people like the NRPA. So that's, that's, the, that's the brief summary of what Open, open Trails is. Uh, and with that, I'll actually get started with the presentation. Um, so I don't see it at all here. Yeah. That's, that's how it works. Yeah. Um, and I'll just... Down arrow. Yep, just down arrow. There we go. Hello. <laughs> well, hello again. Yeah, as you can see, this was uh, sort of um, uh, ambitiously called a data party. Um, <laughs> does anybody have data, GIS data? Did anybody bring GIS data with them? We got somebody in the house with GIS data. We got two people in the house with GIS data. That's great. So we'd love to actually try and use the converter if, if you're interested, or we can just talk after uh, and, and make that happen. But anyway, it's a party about data. Uh, it's early, but we've all had caffeine, uh, so we can call it a party. Um, as we already did introductions, these are our faces on a screen. Um, what we're going to do, I already talked a little bit about as well. Um, I talked a little bit about why open trails. I, I think that the, the really short encapsulation of that is that it's for authoritative data. It's for governments to help communicate 
with visitors. It's very narrowly defined in its purpose. It's for visitor trail maps. It's not a comprehensive data model for trail data management. Um, so we're going to go over that data model. Uh, we're going to walk through the converter tool. Uh, and then we're going to do the thing if you want to. So we have some sample data. Uh, City of Boulder was nice enough uh, to uh, give us permission a while back to use their data in, in demos and things like that. So we'll do that. Um, so as I said, very narrow use case. We really think that this is important when it comes to specific domain specific um, format development. Um, uh, GTFS is another example of a very uh, well-defined uh, uh, use case driving the development of a specification. And so uh, we've tried to really focus on how we're serving the millions of visitors uh, to our, our nation's trail systems every year. Um, parks and public lands do an incredible job uh, serving those those visitors. My favorite statistic from working in Ohio was that between these uh, agencies, they had thirty. Uh, they had thirty park rangers. They had eight million uh, annual visitors. And with the personal conversations, programs, uh, uh, and uh, and other uh, events, they estimated that those thirty people touched eighty thousand a year. Eighty thousand visitors, which is mind blowing. But it's only one percent. Um, it's it's just it's just uh, it's just beyond the scale that um, you can do without technology. And so parks do this great job with signage, installations, exhibits, educational programs, all of these things. Communications is the strong suit of so many of our parks and public lands. But when it comes to communicating on the web, there's a big problem, and that's just that um, we don't have the um, Tradition. We don't have the uh, uh, the mature ecosystem of tools yet, um, and every visit at this point really begins online. It's not not that's perhaps hyperbole. Not every visit does. There's certainly people that spend every day in the park, and they don't they don't need to go online. But the vast majority of visits, uh, the vast majority of all activities, begin online these days. So visitors online and the way people have find and get information has changed and visitors online expect to find um, information. They expect to find uh, reliable, authoritative information and they expect to be able to browse it and compare it easily. Um, but uh, accurate and up-to-date information is not always that easy to find. It's often locked up in image files, in PDF maps, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and what we, uh, what we are um, showing with Open Trails is that open data makes it possible to extend that uh, capability of communication uh, onto the web and into different places. Uh, maps are the foundation for that. Getting your data into these different places is your toehold for, uh, for broader communication. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Lizzie, who's going to talk about the data model itself. And then we'll get into the converter and some of the tooling that exists today. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about the data model. Um, so the key to the data model is that ultimately it's just like the Google Transit Feed specification. It is a group of files. Um, there are three GeoJSON files and two CSV files. For those unfamiliar with GeoJSON, it is um, an a data interchange format that uh, websites really like. Um, it is a ver certain version or brand of JavaScript, so it makes it really easy for a website or a web map to take it, understand it, and display it. Um, simply by getting data into GeoJSON, even if you're like, wow, this standard's stupid. It's not. But if you were to decide <laughs> that um, you, know, you didn't want to do this, I mean, even just all data getting it into GeoJSON is great, because then other developers can use it and put it on maps, generally. We don't store data that way in GIS, but it is um, a way to put it on maps, which is really great. So um, the I'll come back to this slide in a second, actually. The, um, the data standard is five files, trailheads, trail segments, stewards, areas, and named trails. And uh, Ryan and Jeremy are, will talk a little bit more also about how they're all connected to each other. Um, but we have this wonderful cheat sheet 
um, which you can see at that URL up there. Um, and it goes through each of these files and talks about what they do. So um, the trail segments, I'm just read off the screen for you. Um, <laughs> Paths with consistent physical characteristics and appropriate uses that can connect to other segments to form a trail. Um, and all of them are related to each other, right? So this, the trail segments are related to a trail steward. Um, and actually, that is a question I have for y'all. Um, trail segments, if you maintain your trail as like one solid trail, is the trail segment in between two trailheads? Or is it the whole trail? Trailheads can be associated with trail segments. Trailheads can be associated with trail segments. Typically, it's you'll, you'll have a group of segments in a named trail, and you'll have a trailhead at each end, but there are complicated trail networks where you'll have branches, and we wanted to be able to associate trailheads with any segment right, that right. includes sort of a named trail. Yeah. That makes sense. OK. Um, the next one then I'll mention is trailheads. Would you mind changing that guy so I can see it? Cool. Um, trailheads, points of transition or access between trail and non-trail paths. Um, as Jeremy just mentioned, they can be related to many trail segments because you know, trailheads are the connecting points between trail segments and uh, are related to one steward. That's then, kind of an interesting use case, just really quickly, where two trails actually lead from the same point. Mm. That's why we did that. So, Gotcha. That's the many trail segments. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, named trails um, is one of the CSVs, and that's your collection of trails. Um, one of the nuances, I think, that came out in the Open Trails course was about um, managing your trails with names. Um, and you do have to have trail names in order to use a standard. Um, a lot of parks departments don't have trail names from what I understand, so. And the reason for that, hold on. The reason for that is, comes back to the uh, well-defined use case. If you don't have names for your trails, we don't think that's a good experience for visitors. So that was, that was sort of um, the way that that came into, uh, 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 to the fore in this specifications development. Awesome. Um, and uh, areas is the optional file, and that's for um, your land areas through which a trail passes. Um, and that's an optional part of the standard. And then the fifth one, um, which wasn't on one of these screenshots, I, um, <clears throat> was stewards. Um, and um, no, sneeze. Bless you. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. And stewards, all, all features are related to a steward, which goes back to the other side of the house uh, in the specification, that this, is, this specification privileges uh, governments. It privileges authoritative uh, data. And therefore, we associate all features with the uh, 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 responsible party. And again, there's, there's nuance that uh, in, in the real world, uh, maybe there's more than one person responsible. But this is a visitor-focused specification. And to give visitors a good experience, we need to tell them one person uh, that they can get in touch with if they need information, assistance, et cetera. So. Yeah, as Alan mentioned, it really all comes back to the use case and made a good point earlier that you know this isn't a, a data standard for internal management, but for focusing on visitors. I'm going to sneeze like eight more times, so I'm going to hand this off um, <laughs> to Jeremy and Ryan to talk a little bit more about the tools so you can use open trails. Thank you, Lizzie. Sorry. I'm going to actually hold two laptops so I can actually see what's on the screen here. <laughs> so yeah, we had the good fortune of working with a dozen agencies uh, last month where we kind of spent a week, a, a one. we did one webinar per week, and then we had some homework in between. And we learned a lot about sort of some of the challenges with massaging your data and getting it ready for the converter. So we've had quite a bit of experience in this. So what I'm going to do is walk through um, this, this idea of getting your data converter ready. Alan mentioned that um, most of you, if not all of you, are using some Esri products. So your, your data is ultimately in some sort of geodatabase, you know, file geodatabase, shapefile, whatever it is. So the converter tool that, that, that Code for America built and we contributed to and others in the open source community is uh, all about sort of getting your data into a, a, a fairly simplistic shape file format so it can kind of run through the converter. And I'll kind of go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, actually, can you pass those lines? So 
there's a, to get, a lot of what I'm going to show is in this thing called the Open Trails Guidebook. And uh, we developed a site, just opentrailsdata.org. That's probably the most important URL you need today. Uh, it has links to everything Open Trails, all the course material, the guidebook, videos, webinars, um, different open source applications are being built with Open Trails. Uh, and there's a section called the Open Trails course materials, and that's where you'll find uh, information on the guidebook, which I'm going to be alluding to quite a bit. So I'm going to walk through trails, the sort of the trail segment, which is the lines that Lizzie was showing us, and then I'm going to walk through trailheads. And what I'm going to do is kind of break into three sections. What's required? What's the bare minimum you need to do to get your data ready for the converter in order to get your open trails information? Uh, and then what's recommended? Uh, what we'd like you to do, and then what's optimal. So kind of three phases. And I'll go through that for trail segments and, tr and, and trails, uh, trailheads as well. So uh, that top screenshot right there, you'll see a lot of things like that in, in actually both of these in the guidebook. So basically this is uh, the two required fields for trail segments. If you only have a trail layer, a lot of people, a lot of organizations don't have trailheads for various reasons. Um, if you just have trails, if you have a trail name and a trail ID, you can create open trails. It's pretty straightforward. Now, it'll be limited how it's used by the users, right? Because it's just going to have a name associated with it. But um, if you just want to kind of get your data through, get a trail, get, you know, make sure you populate the trail name field. It doesn't need to be populated. It's ideally that it is populated. Actually, I take that back. I think it is required that every, every trail have a name. So we worked with a lot of data that we kind of had to put in fake names to kind of get it through, and then you can update those over time. And then trail IDs is just a unique ID for every segment of trail, just to make sure that every segment has an ID. Now, this we came across a lot of agencies don't manage a unique ID for trail segments. So we've got some information in the guidebook, and we'll probably write up some more uh, info on this in the literature about some of the examples of the way organizations are come out, kind of coming up with unique ID systems. Um, and you can see there on the right the accept, acceptable field names. The way the converter is set up is it's, it sort of has a list of field names that it's going to cross-reference with the trail ID or trail name file, or I'm sorry, field in the attribute table. So those are the acceptable names. That will grow over time, but that's where it's at right now. Okay, so what's recommended for trails? So obviously the different, different visitor use cases is gonna be really critical to your, your visitors, right? Can you bike, can you mountain bike, can you hike, can you, you ski, so forth and so on. And, and another key point about open trails is it's, it's fairly lightweight. There's a lot of information about trails that isn't included right now in the, um, in the standard. And that's sort of by design. We didn't wanna overbuild it early on and have it be so complicated that it would sort of be a barrier to entry. So we took the most common use cases that uh, we, we sort of you know, uh, learned about through the different uh, organizations we were working with. And Alan, you can correct me if I'm wrong in terms of how we came up with that, but. The only color to add is that um, in RPA, which is a membership organization for uh, hundreds of local and state uh, stewards of trails, has a, uh, a, a model uh, for maintaining GIS data, uh, that this uh, has been that Open Trails is cognizant of, and um, and so if you have your data in their recommended model, which is called ProRagis, um, this conversion will be very easy. Um, so yeah, yeah, and and this isn't to say there aren't ways to get additional information about um, your visitor use cases. So we have something called extension profiles which are kind of more in line with the OpenStreetMap uh, data format and schema. And we won't talk about those a lot today, but it's important to know that if you want to add in additional information like status or the hours of operation, that kind of information, that there's a way to do that, um, get it into OpenTrails. GeoJSON is an extensible format. You know, so. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the recommended fields for your trail segments. Uh, pretty straightforward, hiking, biking, equestrian use, cross country, skiing, uh, wheelchair, sort of ADA accessible, and uh, ATV or motor vehicle, and then the acceptable field name. So it's not required, recommended, acceptable field names, um, and then your values in the attribute table are simply gonna be a yes or no. And this is just what it looks like, straightforward in a GIS, you know, in your, in your attribute table, fully populated there. 
And then optimal, optimal is pretty much what I just showed. That's just basically populating all the information. Um, this is just a, a sample data set that we can play with later if we want to. That's got, it's got your trail name. It's got all your attributes, all the recommended visitor use types. You've got your trail ID. Everything's populated. It's clean. This is very uh, converter ready. Okay, now I'm going to transition to trailheads, the, the actual access points into the trails. And just to make this distinction again, these aren't junctions and trails. This is like if you're outside the park and you're going into the park, where would a visitor need to go in order to drop off their bike, park their car, get off the bus, and access the, the actual trail? So with trailheads, it's even simpler. You just need a trailhead name. That's the only required field. Um, now, this is surprisingly challenging because trailheads, a lot of agencies don't have them. And then you got to come up with a name. Naming schemes for trailheads can be complicated. You associate with the name of the road and the park, or the direction, the trail that it's associated with. So come up with your own system. We've seen a lot of different systems. Uh, at this point, just get a name in there. Um, a unique identifier is important, but it's not required. It will be auto-generated uh, by the converter if you don't have one. Uh, obviously, if you're using um, traditional ESRI format, it's going to create some sort of object ID field. Uh, what's recommended? Uh, and I, I would say strongly recommended for some of these. Um, the trailheads, so this, is, this gets a little bit more complicated. So, and Jeremy was talking about this before, each trailhead has a number of trails that are accessible from that trailhead. And it can be the trailhead that's right there. It can be a trailhead that's actually down off of a junction and a mile. However you want to do that, uh, there's an association between trailheads and the trail segments. And that's important for your visitors to be able to find out what trails they're going to be able to access from that trailhead. And then the different use cases is, is also recommended. So here are the... Um, Segment IDs, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then over there is fairly straightforward. That is the, the recommended uses. So address, if you have an address, um, I, I personally don't find this all that useful, but maybe others can, can explain to me why. But I think if, if, if you have an address and it's clear, get it in there. If you don't, the latitude and longitude, the actual geographic location of that is going to be what gets your visitor to that location. And then your... Oops, Technology. Uh, I'm not sure what I did. It's not showing anything No. Oh, I mean the screen is the same. Oh. Let's see if there's just a loose cable or something. <laughs> oh, we have our technical guy. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between the trail segment. Did I hit something? Oh, shoot. I hit the off button. That makes sense. <laughs> OK, so segment IDs, this is where, again, you, in each individual segment has a unique, unique ID. And then somehow you have to figure out a way, and we have a process for this. It's a little, it's not convoluted, but I'm sure people can write scripts or model builder, whatever, to sort of make this easier. But we have this laid out in the, in the uh, guidebook. But basically, every single trailhead needs to have a concatenated field with all the trail segment IDs. This was a real challenge for a lot of the organizations we worked for. So the way that City of Boulder manages their trails, they have an ID system where it's a number and then a, a decimal point and then sort of another number that represents a section of that trail. So two, like two, 233 is, is probably the same name but it's different sections, you know, 23301, 23302. So yeah, that's their, that's their ID scheme. Um, and then you can see like this field here. So this is basically a trailhead that has one, two, three trail segments that are associated with that trailhead, therefore they're accessible. And that's important because when you look at it in an app or on, the, on a website, on an interactive map, it's gonna have the access point and then it's gonna list all the trails that are accessible. So that's uh, kind of a critical piece. Again, a recommended piece but a, uh, I say highly recommended. And this is just so, showing the association between the trail segment attribute table and the trailhead uh, attribute table and how you're basically associating the trail segment uh, IDs with the trailheads. And I can tell you, know, when we break out into sessions, we can talk a little bit more about that. The way that I came up with it was doing sort of a spatial join based on a certain distance. 
which isn't perfect because some trails are greater than the distance I chose in the, in the process, but it gets you started at least. And then it can just be a manual thing too if you've, if you've kind of done that first go through and then you just wanna add some more trail segments to the particular trail IDs. Okay, and then optimal, it's just same thing, just making sure everything is populated. Um, okay, so the last thing to do before it's converted ready is just zip up the individual shape files for the trails and for the trailheads, two separate files. And then we're gonna very quickly run through the converter. So the converter is an open source project. It is uh, constantly being updated and there's a strong community of folks that are contributing to it. Uh, it's all about uploading your um, shapefile in a zip, zipped up format. It'll walk you through all the various steps. You, the first thing you do is load up your trail segments. Um, the first thing it'll tell you is whether or not it's a valid shapefile or not. If it's not valid, then you kind of have to go back and tweak your, um, do a little bit more massage to your data. It'll give you an opportunity to re review your attribute table in this sort of format beforehand, so it looks, make sure it looks like your data. Um, then it'll actually transform your data into GeoJSON, and what it does there is it'll um, give you sort of a look at your attribute table as it was and, and sort of how it's cross-referencing into the new format, so you can kind of do a little quality check right there. Uh, it'll also extract your name trails file, your CSV file, which is coming from that, that names field. So you've created your, uh, your names, you've created your uh, trail segments, and now you get into the steward. And this is basically you populate this information manually. The only thing that's a little unique here is the data license. If you have a data license and it's online, just provide a link. That's important for how people are gonna be using your information. If you don't have a license, we'd encourage you to, op it, um, to use the open, uh, open license. Yeah, if you're a government, your data is in the public domain. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's the sort of default that we recommend. And if you have an extenuating circumstance of some sort, uh, then you'll need to identify that. So just place that, that's the URL there. You place it in there, and then you hit the create, fu create file button, and you're ready to go. So you've got your stewards file. So now you have your trails, your stewards, and now we move on to trailheads. And at this point in the process, if you don't have trailheads, you can skip that and just kind of complete the process and have your open trails ready for trails and stewards. Um, but if you do have trailhead data, upload it. Um, it's going to look the same. It's going to kind of take you a, a few through a few of the same steps. Then you'll get your, um, this is sort of, again, looking at your sample data as it relates to how it's going to be converted. Um, and then you're ready to go. You've done it. You've gone through the process. You've got your trail segments. You've got your name trails, your stewards, and your trailheads. And basically, just download your, your zip file. And at this point, we've got 20 agencies across the country that have adopted open trails in various levels. But I think almost all of them have gotten to the point where they have some sample data. And we're, uh, we're going to bring Jeremy up to kind of walk through some options for next steps of what you can do with your data using uh, Outer Spatial. Right. Hello again, everybody. It's really awesome to see sort of a crowded room of people excited about this stuff. Whereas Ryan and I have been building applications for parks for six, seven years now, and uh, it's awesome to see more people get excited about it. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, uh, I spend my days and most of my nights working on uh, our product called Outer Spatial, which is you can th sort of think of it as an HTTP server specifically for Open Trails data. So at this point, you would have a sort of raw Open Trails data, which is awesome, and you can give that to anybody, and they can sort of use it if they're a web developer. Um, but we add a, add a service that uh, you can upload the data to, and then we give you an API that lets you query that data. So we think it's, there's a lot of good reasons to have the data sort of aggregated. Uh, so you can combine the data sets and build applications regionally. Um, we give the parks ways to uh, get that data back onto their own websites and nice interactive maps so they can sort of get out of the static PDF world and into a more interactive mapping presence on the website. And so, um, and we do a bunch of other stuff that I won't talk about right now, but you can ask me about later. So. Um, yeah, the first, we, and, and we try and make this really easy for somebody coming from the converter to just sign up, upload their file, and then get access to all this stuff that I just mentioned. And so the first step is uh, signing up. Um, this is pretty standard sign up stuff. 
and then just uploading the file. Uh, at this point, uh, it does take a, a little bit of time to actually do the parse the data and get it into our, our data store. Um, and we give them a little status screen for that. Uh, and then they're able to sort of access. So the, the, the stewards file can have multiple stewards in it. And so this screen is really just to give them access to all the different stewards that are in that file. Um, this one's just sample agency. And then they can get to the, the kind of cool stuff. So we build this little embeddable interactive map uh, from their data that shows the trailheads and the trails and lets users click on them. And really, this is just to sort of check the data and let people sort of share something that's not just a big GeoJSON file. This is a little more interesting for people to look at. Um, so they can, they can share this. Um, as I said, you can click on the trailheads and get more information. And all this data is coming from the Open Trails data. Uh, and yeah, they can, they can share it out via URL, or they can embed it uh, somewhere on another web page. Uh, this is sharing <laughs> it via email, in case you guys aren't familiar with that technology. <laughs> um, and this is you know, what it might look like embedded on another, another website. Uh, this is the Open Trails data website, which you should definitely check out. Um, this is the County of Boulder data. Uh, this is a kind of more recent version of the, of the embed that we did. Um, and we're including the, uh, an extra piece of information um, down below called notifications that is something that's not in the Open Trails spec yet. Maybe it will be in a future version, but something that um, where Outer Spatial is actually letting the organizations associate other kinds of data with their sort of core trail data. Uh, so not notifications would be things like this trail is closed for the next two weeks, or uh, they could be sort of steward wide bulletins like uh, an, an event that's running that they want to drive people to. So that kind of data can show up right next to the specific park or trail that uh, the visitor is interested in. So they have all the, all the right information before they get there. Um, yeah, so another interesting uh, thing that we're doing is we're making it very easy to sort of bundle, uh, to, to get this data into applications. So, um, you know, we're Trailhead Labs is we're sort of core contributors right now on all of the main uh, Open Trails projects, and one of them is a uh, a PhoneGap um, native application um, that can very easily be uh, forked and sort of built on top of to do whatever your region wants to do on top of the sort of base uh, that we provide of of sort of accessing the trail information, and so. Um, in one click, uh, once you've uploaded your Open Trails data to our platform, that data can get into that application. So we're, these apps are on my phone right now. I can show them to you. Uh, we're in the process of sort of launching them into the App Store. Uh, there's actually four versions of it. Uh, I was able to spin up uh, three new versions of the app in about an hour for different regions uh, once we had the sort of base infrastructure working. So the screen just shows those buttons. Um, and that's just basically turning it off. And then they can also pull the data out if they want to. So it's really an important aspect of this is kind of giving agencies control and, and authority over their data and, and where it appears and making sure that it, uh, the best data appears in all the right places. And this is the, the very simple sort of notifications form that we provide on that page. This is all, all these screens are all on one page. So at the end of that upload, you'll get this page. And this is all right there. Um, so adding the notification here gets that published out. Uh, it gets it associated with the steward and publishes it out via our API. That gets it into the apps, gets it onto the embeddable widgets, which may be anywhere on the web uh, in, in one click. And this is some screenshots from the actual mobile application. Um, it's coming along using some, new, some nice new terrain-based maps. And uh, these projects, you guys can check them out if you're a developer. If you're an agency, you can tell people about them, tell your de developers about them or ask us about them. Uh, we're more than happy to show you guys how this works. So yeah, I think we'll get into next steps. Great. Yeah, so um, for those of you that are interested uh, in our agencies and have trail data, we did um, produce just sort of a, a short checklist that um, kind of recaps a lot of what Ryan talked about. Um, but you know, really the, the next step is converting what you have uh, and is starting to get whatever GIS data you work with or that you're interested in into uh, a web-friendly format and, and start playing with it. Um, you know, the 
publishing of open data is not necessarily a culturally, um, uh, it's not necessarily a uh, culturally adopted practice in a lot of park agencies. And a, a big thing that we encourage people to do when they publish open trails is actually learn more about open data generally and uh, what it means to publish data and have your community have access to it and what it means to uh, uh, be a member of a community of people using your data, what it means to accept feedback and have an ongoing conversation about how your data could improve. And so in the spirit of that, we encourage people to go with what they have, get it up, get it out, get people using it, start the conversation about how it can improve over time and ultimately begin that forward momentum into creating a data set that uh, uh, really serves your visitors and eventually uh, maybe uh, can serve the entire um, uh, region of visitors that you, uh, that you serve. So those are the next steps. I encourage you to visit opentraildata.org. Um, ask us if you have any questions. Opentrails-discussion is the Google group. That is, that's, uh, you can check out the archives, you can read the sort of canonical documentation of the specification development. Uh, you can also find the specification itself. There's the converter and the validator. Uh, on GitHub, there's the Open Trails, uh, Open Trail Data uh, group, which has a number of different projects. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you and seeing you outside. Can I talk about map time for a oh, please, please talk about map time, absolutely. <coughs> Um, so, map time groups are hands-on, beginner-focused meetup groups for learning about maps, geospatial web mapping. Basically, you know, the 20 or the 25, 30 minutes we spent here talking about open trails and the open trail standard. That's the kind of stuff that you see at map time. Um, typically, we have 40 chapters around the world now. Um, and typically, the way a map time meetup works is that people show up. There's a brief presentation um, and then a hands-on exercise and it's actually a really great way I think for um, GIS analysts to learn about writing code and to learn about web mapping and also for developers to like learn from GIS people about geospatial concepts um, and in terms of learning the skills and tools you need to, to kind of manage a web presence for your parks data, it's a great community builder and a great way to get people excited about what you're doing. Um, there may already be a chapter in your area. Um, you can go to maptime.io is the website and uh, check out. And if there isn't, uh, we have an email address on there and we're happy to help you get one started. Really, the work of the organizer is just to get people together who already want to be together. They, there's just no mechanism for them to get together. So. Um, Map time has really helped me. I was GIS analyst and then I started teaching myself to code and it was through that community that I ended up here. So I think that map time is really cool and in terms of this stuff, um, really great to have a community around the work that you're doing and empower each other and be excited about open trails and excited about GeoJSON and web mapping and, and all that. So also if you have any questions about that, you can talk to me. Oh, and MapTime, MapTime Oakland, which I'm, I'm fortunate enough to run, is sponsored by Trailhead Labs. Um, and that's been really great. And you know, Jeremy has come in. Um, we've had interesting discussions about projections. Um, and uh, if you love map projections, well, you will love MapTime. Um, so yeah. Maybe questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do questions. Questions, discussion, thoughts? And by the way, if everybody in this room doesn't already have an open trail sticker, Oh, yeah, I, that one or two. I think you got to push it. Yeah. Here, we can, we can hand around the stack. We can take one and hand it around. What do you think? What's up, Dan? I've got a question. I'd like to know what kind of challenges you ran into sort of organizing. It sounds like a dozen groups. Well, a dozen members from the class. Of course. Yep. What about organizing the standard? Well, I mean, so there were, there were, maybe 50 or more individual contributors to the, to the specifications development. Um, what you don't want is a panel, right? Um, you don't want a uh, compromised design, that uh, specification design that just tries to please everybody and doesn't accomplish anything in the process. 
And the, the thing that saved us, the saving grace, um, was a clear understanding of the use case we were trying to serve on both sides of the house, right? So we privileged government publishers, authoritative data, people responsible for the features they're putting out into the world, and we privileged visitors, um, sort of your generic uh, average visitor. And that really clarified so many debates and conversations that happened on the mailing list, that happened on conference calls, that happened um, uh, uh, throughout the process. Because people are coming from all different places. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the East Bay Regional Park District is a very different from a National Park Service unit. It's very different from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, different levels of sophistication, uh, uh, different needs, uh, and, um, and uh, those, those use cases really helped, um, helped us broker and facilitate and keep people focused. And oh. give an example of what you might, uh, you know, something in the spec or something in the process that you maybe eliminated by virtue of that focus? Yeah. Status. Um, yeah. There was a there was a lot of um, interest of like, you know, seasonal status, weekly status, like when things were open and closed, and we looked at some other data standards, and we realized that that was sort of a potential black hole was sort of come you know everyone wanting something different, and so that's where the kind of extension profiles come in and give people the ability to add on to it and to the way they want to and. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that and was also, just one example. But. The, the 1.1, the first revision of the spec was based directly on feedback from the agencies converting yeah. their data, right? The switch yeah. to seg trail segments. Oh, yeah. yeah, certainly. Yeah, so I mean, um, if, we're, um, we're going to talk about this tomorrow, just sort of this process and like how we think it can be replicated for other domain specific data sets um, uh, or use cases. Um, it's important to road test. You know, um, so we had an initial uh, set of publishers, four or five, and uh, then we had developers, and we were brokering those two interests, uh, and we made a compromise uh, that caused some developer pain uh, in service of the publisher. And then it turned out when we got a wider sample, that, that was actually causing pain for publishers too. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's really important to just like make sure that you are um, uh, stress testing the spec uh, yeah. as you go through the process. Mm -hmm. And the course really helped us do that and uh, identify this, this pain point on both sides of the house that we could resolve. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, I, I would emphasize that anybody involved in any kind of specification or standard process is like, don't think of it as like a big, you're going into a lab and developing a spec, but try to actually get to the end as fast as possible, right? Like almost integrate it all the way through with all the parties involved. So I was the developer on a, in a, for a lot of this, and we were, we were sort of developing our product to support the spec at the same time as we were developing the spec. I think that was really critical for the spec to be usable for the development community but also to sort of make sure that it was aligned with what the agencies could actually reasonably produce in terms of data. So yeah. I, I think that ultimately the spec is more valuable because of that process. And then the third, the third thing that I'll say on this point, and I'll use it as a slight transition, is that um, ver the, the current version, version 1.1, uh, it's a massive leap forward, but it's not the vision. Uh, there's a there's a bigger vision of of the quality of the data and the uh, and the value of the data that we're that we're going towards, um, and we can't go there immediately because we want to bring the community along with us. And so um, it is we do not require currently that uh, data be um, topologically uh, consistent, uh, which is going to be a major plateau uh, uh, that will that will reach um, and th at that point you'll enable routing services so when you start having topologically consistent data or when you have topologically consistent data which some park agencies trail stewards do uh, the Portland region in particular has done a lot of work 
to make a multi-jurisdictional data set topologically consistent. We're really excited about uh, getting their data into open trails. Um, but a future version of the spec will likely uh, aspire to that or require it. So. Uh, we have about like 30 seconds left and um, I know that there is an open trails mailing list that you can sign up for if you want to learn more about future courses uh, for converting if you want sort of a more oops if you want sort of a more in-depth version of what you saw today and what is the URL for that tinyletter.com slash open trails tinyletter.com slash open trails and uh, then you'll be able to get the latest on the changing specification and new um, capabilities yeah. as well as courses yeah, yeah. it's frozen for a year, that's like sort of our, one of the principles of governance is that like you, you you do the input and then you get to where you need to and then you don't pick at it. You let developers actually uh, get a, get a hold of it and get used to it. Publishers get practice and then you know, but it's a living project onward into yeah. the future. So um, yeah, and, and I would say if anybody has any questions about this, come find any of us yeah. over the for the next couple days. We're right more now, than right happy now is a good time. To, right now is a great time. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> um, let's chat about how to make it happen. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming.